Dr. Arjun Makajani, who's the president for Institute of Energy and Environmental Research in Washington. They have, I think, about 10,000 bombs worth of surplus separated plutonium sitting around in France unused. Well, every plant generates about 30 bombs worth of plutonium every year. When you separate it, uh, you have a situation that's uh, quite complicated. Right now, there have been discussions in Washington today about proliferation. So that's enough about France. Solar energy doesn't have problems that run into tens of thousands of years. It doesn't generate 30 bombs worth of plutonium every year to run a gigawatt plant. You said we produce enough waste for 30 bombs. The, the process of going from waste to bombs isn't very straightforward. You are absolutely right, Senator. And uh, Mr. Chair, I don't want the committee to be left with the impression that somebody can just go get a cask and make a bomb. It is not trivial, and to be left with that impression, I think, misleads this committee. No, I'm sorry if I left that impression. Uh, I started with France, where they do separate the plutonium, so you do have to go through that process of separating the plutonium. The French do have 10,000 bombs worth of separated plutonium, uh, that surplus that's sitting around. No, absolutely, you're quite right, that it is a complicated process that would take a lot, but there are advocates in this country that we should do that, be like France. Dr. Arjun Makajani's misleading statement regarding the nature of spent fuel goes far beyond the challenge of chemical separation. Only select isotopes of plutonium can be used for weapons. For example, plutonium-238 was the very first isotope of plutonium discovered and cannot be used to make a bomb. We use it in radioisotope thermoelectric generators. Apollo astronauts use plutonium RTGs to power their science equipment. The Mars rover Curiosity is entirely powered by RTGs, enabling a wider array of power-hungry experiments and improved mobility than Spirit or Opportunity ever had. The Mars exploration rovers often found themselves short on power as dust settled on their solar panels. They were the only source of energy, and the Martian winter was approaching. The part of it that really breaks my heart is that we just didn't have power to drive anymore. In fact, any space probe sent beyond the asteroid belt has been powered by RTGs because at that distance from the sun, solar panels are useless. A well-powered Curiosity roaming Mars and these spectacular images are all courtesy of plutonium-238. Within each element or family of atoms, there can be different members, each one having the same number of protons but differing in the number of neutrons. The total of an atom's protons and neutrons is its atomic weight. These different members of the same element or atom family, science calls isotopes. Tin, for instance, have a great many isotopes. Others, like aluminum, are lone wolves with just one. These are the plutonium isotopes found in spent fuel rods. There's plutonium-238. NASA has almost run out of 238. But for a bomb, you want plutonium-239. In fact, you need 90% of the plutonium to be 239, and you also need to keep plutonium-240 below 7%. 240 spontaneously fissions. That's a showstopper. So are we choosing between space exploration and weapons here? No, spent fuel from power reactors does not let us do either. We won't power space probes with it. We won't fuel Mars rovers with it and no one will build a bomb out of it. Its only practical use is to be recycled as nuclear fuel and release the remaining 95% of its stored energy. That is its only use. Well, every plant generates about 30 bombs worth of plutonium every year. A power reactor creates plutonium, which is not weapons grade. This number is zero. Isotopic separation of uranium is an expensive but developed technology. Isotopic separation of plutonium is not. A power reactor creates plutonium, which is not weapons grade. Weapons grade plutonium can be created in a military reactor or a research reactor. A research reactor is not designed to produce power, but rather to irradiate materials for testing purposes and to create life-saving medical isotopes. Samples of raw material, such as pure uranium-238, can be slid in and out of the reactor, much like a kiln. 
Such a reactor could also be used to create weapons-grade plutonium by lightly toasting uranium with neutrons for just 59 days and no more. Power reactors are very different. It takes a month to reload the reactor, and the fuel stays inside for six months while the lid is bolted on, making the spent fuel well below weapons grade. Weapons grade plutonium can also be created in a dual purpose reactor, such as the RBMK model, known to most people as the Chernobyl reactor. Energy is generated until the fuel rods are lightly toasted, and then the fuel rods are removed before they become spent. Weapons-grade plutonium can also be created by operating some Western-style reactors, such as Kandu-6, illegally. Most Western reactors are designed to make this task of toasting fuel extremely difficult, because it takes an entire month to shut down a reactor and remove fuel rods. And the lack of electrical production during the shutdown is easily detected by satellites and on-the-ground inspectors. Today, Western reactors are closely monitored by the United Nations International Atomic Energy Agency to ensure that what emerges is spent fuel and not toasted fuel. Also, weapons-grade uranium, highly enriched uranium, can be created in a fuel enrichment facility by enriching natural uranium far beyond what is needed to fuel a nuclear reactor. Iran may have been pursuing nuclear weapons by this path until 2012, when Stuxnet went into action. Stuxnet was a clandestine software tool used by the United States to destroy billions of dollars worth of Iranian centrifuges. Iran's enrichment operation involved no spent fuel, no toasted fuel, and no nuclear reactor whatsoever. It only involved uranium. Finally, Weapons-grade plutonium cannot be made by operating any Western power reactor in a manner stipulated by international treaty since 1970, not even a Kandu-6. Legal operation results in spent fuel, not toasted fuel. Of the 16,000 nuclear warheads on the planet today, not a single one was created from spent fuel plutonium. Nor did plutonium from spent fuel explode in any of the 2,000 nuclear weapons tests ever conducted. Well, every plant generates about 30 bombs worth of plutonium every year. This is a misleading statement. It is misleading for France, and it is misleading for the United States, where Dr. Arjun Makajani testified before Minnesota's Senate. Iran is the clearest contrast between Makajani theoretical and real-world doable. By most accounts, Iran would like to possess an atomic bomb. They've been running a nuclear power plant since 2012, and they have their own enrichment facility. They are a very capable nuclear power. So why did Iran focus on uranium enrichment if their goal was weapons production? Because trying to make a weapon with a commercial power reactor is foolish. The entire world can see what you're doing. Iran's centrifuges invited Stuxnet sabotage and billions of dollars of damaged hardware. In contrast, Iran's power reactor is internationally monitored and operates without condemnation from the United States. Makajani's fuel rod doomsday scenario sounds plausible only if you don't know what an isotope is. No, I'm sorry if I left that impression. Uh, I started with France where they do separate the plutonium, so you do have to go through that process of separating the plutonium. The French do have 10,000 bombs worth of separated plutonium, uh, that surplus that's sitting around. No, absolutely, you're quite right that it is a complicated process that would take a lot, but there are advocates in this country that we should do that. Be like France. Yes, we should be like France. In the 1980s, France drastically reduced their carbon emissions by turning to nuclear power. Their per capita carbon footprint is lower than even Germany, 
and France achieves this with dated recycling technology and 1970s style nuclear reactors. As Dr. Arjun Makajani travels the world conflating spent fuel with nuclear bombs, he's making the job of any bomb-seeking nation easier, not harder. This is because a nation's ability to extract toasted fuel from their reactor depends a great deal on which reactor they've built. Anti-nuclear activists have been taught to see all nuclear power plants as bomb factories, and so there's less pressure on bomb-seeking nations to build reactors which make proliferation impossible. Iran's power reactor is technically capable of toasting fuel, and international monitoring is now essential. Dr. Arjun Makajani and anyone else who restates the bombs per gigawatt falsehood Each reactor makes 500 pounds of plutonium a year. You only need 10 pounds to make a nuclear weapon. So you get the plutonium, which is great because you can make bombs with it. Facilitates weapons proliferation. Confusion is not helpful. If we move to uh, renewables in a big way, yeah. but you would not be able to have the kind of power um, yes, you that, would. that we have oh, now. Oh, yes, you I would. I do think that we'd have to... Yes, you would. I commissioned a report in America called Carbon Free, Nuclear Free. It's a study that I set up by a brilliant physicist called Arjun Makajani. By 2030, America could have all the energy it needs from solar, from wind, from geothermal, from conservation. To smelt aluminum or to make aluminum, it requires huge amounts of energy. We've got to stop using aluminum cans. That's just crazy. And all this frozen food is just obscene too. We shouldn't be freezing food. When I was a kid, there was no frozen food. We did all right. You know, in the winter, it's so hot inside, you have to strip. The thermostat should be lowered. Why don't you hang your clothes outside in the sun to dry using the nuclear reactor in the sky? Every time you walk into one of those doors and it goes in front of you, that's powered by electricity. So every time you walk through a door that goes psh, psh, it's either a carcinogenic door or a global warming door, which means your kids have no future. It's sort of almost a testosterone um, supplement. <laughs> I think it makes them feel strong and powerful because when you fish in the atom, you, you actually harness the energy of the sun. We have to have humility and understand who we are, and then we're not. We're not God. We're, we're just fallible human beings who make mistakes, and therefore we must eradicate all things nuclear. Caldecott is as anti-nuclear as anyone could possibly be. These people should be tried like the Nazi war criminals were at Nuremberg. And I'm fed up with them. Well, Mozart and, and Shakespeare wrote by candlelight. Light? I'm writing an article for the International Herald Tribune now about the future of nuclear power and I ended it by saying that and said, and they, the editor wrote back and said, well, you don't want to encourage people to think they have to go to candlelight again. Now, Bill Gates, I think, is doing some good work with this money. He's, he's setting up to immunise all the children of the world. He is taking responsibility. You can do wonderful things with money if you've got it. As I got focused on the work of my foundation and the lives of the poor, and I looked at what innovations could improve their lives, allow them to have cheaper food fertilizer, to have more building materials, uh, to have a refrigerator, to have light to read at night, I realized the very central role that energy plays in improving their livelihood. And so we need breakthroughs. Uh, now, if the solar guys you know, get 10 times as cheap and solve the, the storage challenges they face and the, the transmission difficulties where the energy's not exactly where you need it, you know, that's wonderful. In fact, I, I invest some in those areas. But when you look at the numbers and you say, what could be uh, significantly cheaper than, than what we have today and located in, in every area, a nuclear is one of the few uh, that may be able to achieve that. 
they trot people like Bill Gates and out there yep. to, to to be our friends and to sell us this stuff. Yeah, but you don't yeah. you don't have to believe Bill Gates because he's filthy rich. Well, yeah, but a lot of people do. Yeah, but don't. <laughs> I mean, where's I your cynicism? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, Americans are very gullible. I commissioned a report in America called Carbon Free, Nuclear Free by a brilliant physicist called Arjun Makajani. I think this warrants at least the same amount of skepticism as any health report commissioned by the tobacco industry. Anti-nuclear activists read on Makajani's website that an atomic bomb test was successfully conducted with reactor-grade plutonium in 1962. Anti-nuclear activists will not know that in 1962, Reactor grade had a much different definition than it does today, and that same sample would no longer qualify. The 1962 plutonium did not come from any United States power reactor spent fuel. It came from a reactor capable of toasting fuel. If Dr. Arjun Makajani wants to slow proliferation, then he should explain to non-technical audiences what an isotope is. That would be helpful. If Dr. Arjun Makajani wants to help reduce greenhouse gas emissions, then discussion of the French nuclear program and Germany's energy wind should also compare per capita carbon footprints. That would also be helpful. When they get to be any meaningful percentage, that's where the problem of their intermittency becomes overwhelming. And you can actually spend way more to try and solve that problem than you spend on the, the overpriced stuff to begin with. I think people deeply underestimate what, what a huge problem that is. The economics are so, so far from being appropriate. 